Today, I want to walk you through how we think about end-to-end -end AI and how we offer that to our customers here at Clarify. And so I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background about who we are, um, where we are based, and, uh, and more about what we do. So I founded the company about uh, six years ago now uh, at the end of doing my PhD on exactly what we offer, understanding images and video automatically with AI. And I was very fortunate to work with some of the pioneers like Jeff Hinton, Yann LeCun, Rob Fergus, Jeff Dean in the AI space uh, well before it was like the hot new area. So we're headquartered in New York because I went to uh, NYU for my PhD and stayed there afterwards. And after I incorporated the company in 2013, we ended up winning ImageNet that year, which is a big competition in the research community to understand a thousand different categories of objects. And we actually won the top five places in the competition. So it was a great way to kick off with the world's best image recognition. And we've been kind of carrying that crown ever since. And that's why backers like uh, Menlo Ventures, Union Square Ventures, uh, Lux, uh, Qualcomm, NVIDIA, and Google have backed us with over $40 million to date. And just last week, um, news came out that we were named a leader in the Forrester uh, Computer Vision New Wave report. And we were named amongst uh, AWS, amongst uh, Microsoft, Azure, and Google. So it was us four named as leaders. So it was quite the honor um, to, to get that kind of recognition for all the hard work we've been doing. We were also named one of the fastest growing uh, startups in North America, uh, 71st by Deloitte uh, a couple weeks ago. So lots of uh, momentum building here at Clarify. And so what we do is pretty simple. We understand your images and video and tell you what's in them. So in this case, when this image is uploaded, we can recognize the things you see on the right. Uh, it's kind of hard to read on this screen, but you can see things like water and boat. Um, you'll see a video of this actually in, in action in a little bit. Um, and you'll see, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, and so you'll see a video of this in action in a little bit. There's a weird echo up here. That's why it sounds like I'm talking loud. So I'm going to talk about how you get to this level of world-class AI and all the steps that it takes. And we've kind of formulated that into our platform so that you can do it yourself, building your own AI models custom for your use cases for your business. And so the way we look about it is like this. So you start kind of in the top left there where you have your input data. These are your images and video that are important to your business. The next step that is usually involved in building AI is annotating that data so that you can teach a model how to recognize what you care about in your business. So we provide user interfaces and APIs to do that at scale. All of that data that you're annotating is actually indexed for search. And this is really important because you can actually f slice and dice your data sets dynamically. And we haven't seen anybody else be able to offer this kind of functionality. And a lot of our customers use that search as an API itself to power products like visual search or recommendation systems. Then once you have your data set, um, you can use that for training. And we combine that data that it's important to your business with the state-of-the-art algorithms that our research team has adapted from the research community. And we have them uh, tweaking classification models, detection models, all the types of models that might be important for your business. And once you hit train, it literally takes a few seconds, which you'll see, and it creates a new model version. So everything is version, kind of like if you're used to GitHub or, or GitLab or Git in general, you get a version that you can then tie to your production deployments um, so that it, it's reproducible. And when you deploy the model, you're allowed on our platform to deploy to mobile devices. We have iOS and Android SDKs. We have our API hosted on AWS in the cloud. And then we have the ability to deploy on-premise, even into air-gapped on-premise uh, environments, so not connected to the internet at all. And that's uh, a big reason the Department of Defense is, is one of our large customers. Um, and finally, you can use that model for prediction. Once it's deployed, you can predict and get the insights from it for whatever application you have. And the arrow coming back is actually what we like to think about as active learning. So these predictions can be used to train and improve future versions of your model automatically. So this is kind of the end-to-end -end AI that we're going to be walking through today. And overall, Clarify offers us in, as a whole ecosystem, where we have something called Portal, which is when you log into our website, you get access to Portal, which is a complete set of UIs to do everything you just saw. All those UIs are powered by APIs. So if you have your own user interfaces or your own product you want to integrate with, we allow you to do that directly with our APIs. And the deployment to anywhere is really what we call our AI fabric. It lets us run wherever you need to run, and everything works seamlessly together. 
finally, we give some developer tools like API clients and great documentation so you can get up and running within minutes. And if you need some extra help, if you're a large enterprise or need some customization you don't see in our documentation, we provide a variety of services to, to bridge that gap. So let's look at the data labeling component first. And I'd love to show you a live demo, but the internet is uh, not so good in here. So we're going to be showing a few videos today. So these are screenshots from what it looks like in Portal. This is the user interface you get when you sign up for Clarify. And by the way, you can sign up for free. So you can get started without even swiping a credit card. It takes a few seconds to sign up. And you can see exactly what I'm showing here. So we manage everything within apps. This is your collection of data. And you can have as many apps as you want in your account. So you might have different parts of your business doing different complete things, recognizing dogs, recognizing uh, food, recognizing faces. And so the data and the models that do that are not really related. So you can keep them in separate applications. Then once you um, go into the explorer mode, this is the mode that's meant to manage that data. Upload your data literally by drag and drop or dumping in URLs or any of this can be done through our APIs as well. And then you can do searches over that data to slice and dice it and find exactly what you have in there. And the searches are powered by our AI so that we can recognize things before you even do any human work on it. And that's really valuable because um, a lot of the times when you're annotating data, if you can search and find high level things quickly, um, you can uh, speed up the process of annotation as well. And then you can also kind of test out your models that are, or any of the Clarify pre-built models that are available. So you go into any single image, and you can see the results right there on the right-hand side. You're seeing predictions from one of the models, and below you're seeing uh, similar images. So you might be able to find uh, similarities within your data set. And then finally, any of those labels you can add yourself. So this is the human annotation part. And we make it super easy. Literally just type in. It adds a new concept to your image. And you can even add negatives. That's why there's a checkbox and an X for each of the uh, available concepts. So that's what we're talking about with the, the first phase here, the annotation phase in the top left. And then what it looks like to do search. Um, is is really powerful. So we showed you a little bit there when you could search for things like berries um, or, or dog or any of the common concepts that our models recognize. But we also uh, offer this as an actual use case for customers because of that visual search that you saw a glimpse of. Uh, we can use that for applications like this where you might have a, you know interior design shot. This might be your own house or whatever. And you want to see, or, or a friend's house or something from a magazine. You want to see you know, what is that refrigerator, what is that microwave, what is that faucet, what is the wood chair, and automatically search a large collection of images. So we have people like West Elm as customers doing exactly this use case. You can actually upload a Pinterest board to West Elm, and it'll extract your preferences from that and recommend furniture that you might be interested in automatically. So this is what we're talking about with visual search. It's also very relevant for fashion. This might be you know, a, a paparazzi shot of a famous celebrity, and you really like her hat, so you just crop out that image of, or that region of the image. And if it's indexed on a retailer site, uh, you might find results like this automatically. So enough kind of slides. I'll show you what it looks like kind of as a video. So this is what you're seeing uh, as an example app that's set up for stock photos. So there's about 20,000 stock photos in here. And the bar at the top is where we'll be able to enter searches. So if I'm looking for things like dogs, I can just type in dog and find that automatically. I can make the query more complex as well. So dogs and grass. And now I get more specific. Um, so this is all recognizing uh, things in your data without you doing any manual work. That was showing predictions from our general model, which recognizes these common things. Now, when you have images that you, you're not really sure what the keywords would be to find, um, the, the, the really powerful thing you can do is visual search. So if I'm looking for like a boat on a calm lake near a sunset, I can just use that as the query. So you can see in the search bar, it's the image itself. And it found itself. It found duplicates. And then it found a couple other photos from the same photo set. And then kind of a continuum of visually similar content. 
to all this without having to figure out what keywords would make sense to find that content. And so this is what you saw with that fashion shot or you know, looking for a microwave or maybe it's a security application. You see that person, you have no idea what their name is, or you see that vehicle. You can just use that as an example to query your data to find it automatically. So this is what our search product looks like um, from the view of a portal. But again, everything you just saw is powered by APIs. So if you're on your journey to, to train really great AI, uh, the next step is that training process. And we looked at how everybody does it today and has been doing it for the last six years since I founded the company. And it looks like this. You get lots of code together. You download TensorFlow or PyTorch or MXNet. You get your hardware together, GPUs. There's um, some new kind of purpose-built AI hardware as well. You typically need a thousand examples per thing you want to recognize. So, you know, dog or grass or whatever um, labeled. So that's really time intensive. And then you usually need data scientists to kind of tweak all the knobs and write that code and figure out how to get this all to work. And then you hit train, and it still takes weeks of time to get any results. And that's kind of how it's been for the last six years. Um, other than using Clarify. So we launched this product three years ago in 2016, around this time, in the second version of our API, uh, which is the current version. And what we got that lines of code down to is literally like four lines of code um, in languages like Python. And we host the hardware for you. It's all on AWS. You don't even have to think about it. And we got the requirement for amount of training data down to literally just a few examples. And you can, you can actually start with one, and you get reasonable results. And we made it so simple in Portal that anybody can do it. Because uh, we really wanted to get AI into everybody's hands. And the most important thing is we got the time down from weeks of iteration to literally seconds. And this is something we did from both a research perspective and an engineering perspective to hold a lot of stuff in memory and to uh, tune the algorithms really well to learn very quickly on little amounts of data. And so as a kind of example, you could label some things positive, like maybe you're training uh, an F-22, label them positive, label other airplanes negative. That's all it takes to learn something that could predict on this image with you know 99 0.9 or 99.5% or uh, confidence. So let's take a look at that workflow in Portal. So again, we're going to look at an app that's already set up with data. In this case, it's my data, uh, my personal photos. And let's say I want to train my dog. Um, so I have lots of pictures of my dog in here. So the general model that recognizes common things like dog is really valuable because I can just search for a concept like dog and find a bunch of them. Now, to train the system, I need to label a few examples. So I'm just going to select the first three here. And uh, then I'm going to tell the system that this is my dog, Rolly. So that's his name. And I'm just going to hit Done. And then on the top left, you're going to see a couple things pop up. This is a custom model. So just like our general model or some of our other pre-built models, this is now another model, but it's specific to your app. And it has one thing in it, Rolly. Now, to learn from these three pictures, it needs to do the training process. And so we can just click on the dots here and hit train, and it's going to start learning. And this is the process that we got down to literally a few seconds. It's already complete, that bar that scooted across. And now, when you go into any of these one uh, or any of these images, you see it's 100% confident in these first three pictures, which it should be, because that green check and indicates that we've manually labeled them. But as we start going through other examples, you'll, you'll see that it's actually learned how to recognize my dog. And on new pictures, it can still recognize him with high confidence. So here on this uh, fourth picture, it's 99% confident. And there, if you notice, there's another dog in here that's clearly not my dog. Um, and we should get to him in a second. And here, uh, I can give negative examples as well. So marking it as an X. Uh, treats it as a negative, and I can retrain the model again in just a few seconds, and then it's going to re-predict, and you can actually see the difference there. It pushed the confidence down even more towards zero. So that's how simple it is to build AI. Uh, and this is really exciting to us because at this point, almost every one of our customers has a custom model that they have built themselves or we've built as a service for them. 
and it really opens up the number of applications because developers signing up for us um, educate us on all these different use cases. So, for example, this is a use case where somebody set up a, a Raspberry Pi looking at a baby monitor and uh, trained it to recognize when the baby's standing or the baby's sleeping. And you can see the ones with the green checks are the, the training data, uh, but it's finding a bunch of other ones that are automatically found by the model. Uh, and a very important one, the baby is missing. So that's how simple it is to uh, get AI with really high accuracy really quickly into your applications. Now the final kind of stage, now that you've done all this work of training, is to actually deploy it. And this is where we offer you a bunch of different options. So our cloud API is currently hosted on AWS, and it has been since 2014. Uh, our mobile SDKs operate on iOS and Android devices. Um, so uh, you can actually come see afterwards, if you're interested on my iOS device, what it looks like. And, then, uh, and that runs completely disconnected from the internet as well. So you can uh, uh, do some things in remote areas, for example. And then on-premise, this allows you to run our incomplete platform, not just predictions like our mobile SDKs offer, but you can do search, you can do training, you can do labeling of data, you can do everything you just saw on your own servers. And this is really flexible. It's all running within Kubernetes. And so to take a look at kind of what that stack looks like, um, so all of the components are written as microservices for each of the different things you saw, like training and prediction. They're all separated out and they're all kind of coordinated with a Kubernetes cluster. And so when you're making a request to our API, that actually hits a Go, uh, Go language microservice. We chose Go for its threading model and, and high uh, concurrency. And then it uh, has load balancers between all the backend uh, microservices. And so some of those microservices, let's say this uh, request is for a prediction, some of those are gonna be neural network models. And so those are the things you see in the bottom. And we've done some clever packing of machines that we can actually pack multiple models on the same machines. This is not necessarily recommended by uh, NVIDIA, um, but we've actually wrote some custom Kubernetes plugins to allow you to do this. And so it allows us to save a lot of money on, on machine costs because a lot of the models, like these custom ones, might not be used very frequently. So we don't want to tie up GPU memory. Um, and we also didn't want to have any kind of long latency for your first request. So we didn't want to swap models in and out either. So the packing uh, worked out well for us. And then all of these microservices are connected with gRPC as the RPC mechanism um, and sending proto buffers around. Um, so that's kind of an overview of our, our architecture here. And all of these models kind of auto scale. Um, at, at, the, at the top, we use AWS ELBs uh, to kind of route to multiple of these Go APIs as well. OK, so finally, let's look at what uh, uh, some of these good models doing some actual predictions looks like. And the use cases are really broad. So we have some models that do uh, detection. In this case, we're detecting people in a retail store. So this might be useful if you want to count the number of uh, traffic you have in an event like this. Um, that would be kind of cool to see how many people are walking through each part of the, the venue. And if you kind of wrap that with some higher level analytics, you can give a really uh, informative dashboard. Like maybe this was actually a, a real demo we did in our office. Maybe you're interested in heat maps. Like where are the most common places people are in, in your store or your stadium? Um, and then what time of day are they there? You can kind of see that on the right hand side. Um, and a few different things like analytics about different zones that you might mark off in your stores or any physical thing like an office. And so, Let's take a look at some of these, uh, these pre-trained models. So I showed you how to customize models specifically for your use case, but really they're powered by the, the underlying power of our pre-trained models, which have been trained on tens of millions of images with high quality labels. And so in this case, we're uh, uploading the image. It goes, this is actually a live demo. You can go to it uh, whenever you want, clarify.com slash demo. And you see the image uploaded, and you see it recognize objects like water and boat. But then you also see uh, descriptive words like evening and reflection. And, uh, and we're going to go to another image in a second. And this is actually sending it up to our API and back. The API response time is usually like 100 or 200 milliseconds. So you can actually put this at real time um, applications. And these descriptive words are really interesting, like love and affection and togetherness. Uh, we're, we've only seen our API be able to learn these types of high-level concepts. So it makes for really unique um, 
use cases in consumer photos and social media. And we also support video, like I mentioned off the start. This is what it looks like when you upload a video clip. This happened to be a three minute video clip that we processed in about five seconds. So orders of magnitude faster than real time, we give a whole time series of information back. And if I'm looking for something in a video, I can filter to what I'm looking for, like mountain, and then click where the line is very confident. So the higher the line, the, the more confident the model is. And as I jump around, different things become very likely because in this case, there's a lake in front of snowy mountains at this part of the video. And so that's what it looks like to uh, analyze video with our general model, which recognizes over 11,000 common things in your data. And we can do this with any of our models, including custom models as well. So if you want to look for something specific, you can also do that in video. Now our general model uh, is a special model that has the ability to recognize in 23 different languages as well. We're the only vendor who can actually do this, um, and it's the most common languages across the globe. And the reason we can do this is we've actually built an underlying knowledge graph under the hood of Clarify's API. And it knows the differences between common things, uh, like in English, the word crane might mean a machine that lifts things, or it might mean a species of bird. So in our knowledge graph, we had to separate out those meanings, and then we could translate them into the other different languages. And we've, I, I only speak English, but I've heard it, it looks pretty good. And so this is really powerful, and we're going to be actually announcing some more APIs around Knowledge Graph coming soon. Now, the general model is just one of our pre-trained models. We have an entire suite of them, so you can get up and running in minutes for your different use cases um, if some of these models fit your needs. And you can, again, see them right on our website, going to our uh, what we call model gallery, which is what you're seeing here. And some of the models have uh, different kind of outputs. In this case, the celebrity model outputs a bounding box of where a face is detected. And then it classifies out of 10,000 different celebrities who that might be. The demographics model is a similar uh, one where it actually has a bounding box. But then it uh, classifies three pieces of, of information, uh, gender, age, and multicultural appearance. So if you want to understand who your customers are walking through your front door, for example, um, you can get high-level demographic information uh, from that model. We have a bunch of other classifiers like food and travel. And then a big part of our business is moderating out content. So if, you have, uh, if you're a company that has any upload button um, on the internet, you're going to get drugs, you're going to get nudity, you're going to get weapons, you're going to get violence. And this is stuff that could really hurt your brand long term. And so we can recognize that stuff as it's being uploaded and prevent it from even um, reaching your, your website. And we do this with large e-commerce marketplaces, for example, where buyers and sellers are trying to trade goods. There's a huge problem with, uh, with a lot of this uh, unwanted content. OK, so we showed you how to build great models and look at some of the, the great models we have already built. Um, but the last stage that I mentioned in that diagram is completing the loop um, to get those predictions back to improve future versions of your models. And so this is what we call active learning. And so your model might be there in green. And let's take that uh, nudity recognition as, as the use case. And you get the predictions back. Now, you might want to do a few things with them. The, they might uh, be you know, great uh, or very confident that it's nudity or very confident it's not nudity. And in that scenario, you might want to just trust those labels and start training on them. But there's going to be some um, labels that are predicted as uncertain. They're just not very confident. And so that's where you can have humans review those labels. And once they verify if it's uh, nudity or not, that can go into your training set as well. And then finally, the, the last set is stuff that's just not suitable for training. And we see this a lot. It's kind of the out of distribution data that's coming in. So for example, in our food model, if people are sending in uh, pictures of nudity, like that is not related to food. And so um, it shouldn't be used in the training set regardless. So that's kind of how we've set up this uh, active learning problem. And so this could be really powerful for your own custom models as well, because you might be training something like you know, SUVs uh, versus sports cars. And again, because it can learn so quickly, uh, you can start with one example, train a model, and then start feeding it additional examples. And over time, it can start learning from those predictions to make it better and better to start automating the process for you. And the way we like to look at that long term is when you download some of these open source tools, maybe you're, you're eager to get into AI, and that's cool, but uh, you're probably going to get tied into something else in your business, building your product and actually differentiating your company. Now, that's the TensorFlow set it and forget it mode. 
if you use some of our pre-trained models, they might not work as good for your specific problem, but over time they're going to get better because we're adding more data and having algorithm improvements. And so when we release these new improvements, you see kind of a staircase in accuracy. And at some point that could surpass uh, what you're building with off-the-shelf tools. Now, if you use our custom training, it already starts better than what you can build yourself because it's leveraging data that you don't have access to. And this is a huge advantage you can have in your business. And again, it improves when we in improve the algorithms under the hood. And then finally, as you're collecting more and more data and, and kind of continuously training quickly, um, that's that blue line, which is like the continuous improvement of AI. And this can get really, really advanced for your specific uh, business. Um, and so just to show you a few more of these kind of predictions that have been well-tuned, here we're looking at a security application where we're uh, recognizing people, recognizing bicycles. You can see the vehicles in the back are being tracked as well. Um, and all this is happening with uh, a detection model. Oh, sorry. Let me just skip ahead. Uh, here's another application where we made kind of an Amazon Go store in our office. And so we put a bunch of food on a shelf and trained the model to be robust to occlusions uh, and to recognize the different categories of food. And so you can't really read the red writing, but it's actually recognizing the specific product. Um, so there's different types of pizza on the shelf, for example, and it can tell them apart. It's also handling the occlusions really well, as you can see when people are walking past. And it's a hard problem because you have to actually track it into the person's hand. And so that gives you an example of, um, of how we've kind of completed the loop and built some really great uh, models for specific use cases. And it's really a difficult challenge because when you actually start applying these to real applications like we've been doing for the last six years, you start seeing edge cases that are really difficult. And so this is an example uh, of a model that's recognizing nudity and uh, the results are in the, in the blue there. And we're recognizing that this is safe because this is actually the, the lady's elbows, um, but it could look like something else. Um, there's edge cases like this that can throw off classifiers. Um, there's edge cases like this that we've seen throw off classifiers. And then you have to be robust to even edge cases like this. So um, it's, it, once you get to the real world, it's always a, a different story than your original training set. So that's why the act of learning uh, to improve things is really important. Um, I also want to cover, uh, so everything I showed you so far is kind of object recognition and kind of descriptive words. But we have that whole end-to-end -end pipeline uh, working for face recognition as well. So if you want to recognize people's identities beyond just celebrities and beyond age, gender, and multicultural appearance, you can now teach the system to do that. So it might be your friends, might be your family, might be your VIP customers walking in the front door. The applications for this are ginormous. It's uh, really in every major vertical, there's going to be face recognition deployed. You're already seeing it in air travel. Um, people like Delta at the JFK terminal um, in New York have cameras deployed at the gates. And uh, I actually experienced my first time of it working um, a couple weeks ago. So it's starting to actually uh, be in use. But you can see in a city like Las Vegas in casinos, there's huge applications to recognize VIPs walking in the front door. And of course, lots of things in law enforcement, security, and surveillance. Uh, and so when we look at what that experience looks like in Portal, when you're trying to train somebody's face, you might have uh, a bunch of bounding boxes that are recognized automatically. So this is our models recommending that we see a face here. And then all you have to do is type a person's name. So it's very similar if you've ever used Facebook to that experience. Well, um, but in this case, instead of just tagging it for, for their benefit, you're doing it to train a model. So this might be uh, Michelle Obama. And then uh, that data um, is now labeled on the detection. And again, you go through that same experience of just training the model, which takes a matter of seconds. And something I didn't get an opportunity to show you is how each of those model versions that I talked about appears in Portal. So in this uh, screenshot, you're seeing two model versions, um, and each of those can be evaluated. So this is really important when you're trying to compare, is this model getting better? Is it getting worse? And so here, 
is what that evaluation page actually looks like. So you're seeing a confusion matrix, or sorry, you're seeing a, a set of uh, precision and recall scores for each of the different categories in here. So it might be uh, Michelle and uh, Madeline and Malala, um, and each of them have the amount of training data, true positives, false positives, that kind of stuff. Below that, which is not shown, you get a confusion matrix as well. So you get to see uh, what are the confusions that are happening between what was labeled and what the model's now currently predicting. And so that is an important component that's not really represented here, um, but is uh, uh, an important part of that model version process before you're deciding to deploy. And that can be used to educate you on whether you even want to you know, disrupt your production deployment and send a new model up. Okay, so that covered the kind of end-to-end AI building process um, using our platform. Now I'm just going to dive into a few of these um, to explain how broad the platform has become over the years. And we actually just went through this process recently to summarize it because there's so many features now that it's getting hard to talk about it in just a few slides. And so Portal is the user interfaces and allows you to do your app management, allows you to explore your data. And something we just introduced, which is really exciting, is the ability to do collaborations. So if I'm building a model, like the, my dog, for example, I could invite my wife, who might have additional images, she can upload to my app, she might label some more images and train the model. Now, in some of our large customers, like a large retailer um, has deployed our platform on-premise, they're training 3,000 models next year, 3,000. It's gonna be our biggest uh, deployment of people building models on our platform to date. And it's really exciting because they have a whole uh, hierarchy of roles within their organization. They have managers who um, care about the, the workers labeling the data. They have the individual uh, labelers, so you want to invite them as collaborators, but with restricted permissions. So they can't delete data, they can't add data, all they can do is label data. Then they have deployment people that only have the permission to deploy and upgrade models um, in production. So all that is now possible with collaborators. Now these APIs, I showed you a lot of the different types of prediction, but it didn't really capture everything. Um, some of the things that we haven't shown are segmentation models, which are available, uh, optical character recognition models. Um, and the set of models is really, really broad now. So the way we think about that is the model is kind of that, uh, that piece in the middle. You have different types of inputs. We support images and video so far. And then we have different types of outputs. Um, and this is where we go through the laundry list of, of possible types of outputs, including things like logos or even embedding vectors. So these are kind of intermediate stages of the neural network that you can then use uh, with your machine learning team to train on top of. So maybe you're building a recommender system, which is something we don't offer um, in the platform. Uh, you want to take those and throw them into a recommender system and train a few layers of neural nets on top of them uh, for different use cases. So all of the pre-built models are uh, covering a lot of different use cases at this point. Um, so these are, might not all be on our website, but you can chat with our sales team. Uh, we actually have Kyle, uh, who leads our sales team over here. So feel free to grab him afterwards to learn about any of these and how you can get started on Clarify. Now, once we look at um, the, the process of adding data to your app, Something that we didn't call out explicitly is that process of indexing and running workflows. So indexing is when you upload, we actually run a bunch of models under the hood to be able to surface tags like dog or grass that I was able to search over. And that set of models is what is called a workflow. It's actually a graph of models, um, so you can actually tie models to the outputs of other models um, and make arbitrary complex computations. Uh, so it's a really powerful feature that we haven't called out uh, to date explicitly, um, but it's available in our APIs as well. To cover search, uh, we have a lot of different ways of searching. It could be over your labeled data, it could be over the predictions from our models. And then we support things like metadata, which is just a JSON blob, um, which could be your business information. So it could be like a product identifier or a SKU number, a uh, user ID, something like that, uh, or a batch of data number. Uh, you're gonna see a lot of flexibility coming out of this in the, in the near future as well. Uh, geo coordinates, we let you index latitude and longitude, so maybe you want to find uh, this specific person within this you know, one mile radius of a specific geo location. And then visual search, like you saw. So lots of different variety of types of searches, and all of them can be combined together. So you can 
say, I want to find stuff that looks like this um, in this uh, coordinate with this product ID or data dump ID as an example. Um, we already covered this, how we kind of deploy everywhere. Um, in terms of the API client, we offer them in a variety of different languages. Uh, a variety of different languages. Uh, Python, Java, JavaScript, uh, C, Sharp, uh, PHP, and a bunch of others. And you're going to see a, a new set of these coming out uh, that are for more advanced developers that actually have a gRPC interface directly. And this is really uh, good because it's going to let you get the latest features from Clarify uh, much more quickly and be more efficient because it can send binary information instead of encoding it as JSON. Um, so you'll, you'll see that very shortly. Um, some of them are actually on our GitHub repo already, uh, like Python. Um, and then finally, if, if you want to have us take over and, and do some of the model building, some of the data labeling, or even kind of advise you on how to best apply AI in your business, uh, we're happy to do that. Um, and that's something, again, you can talk to Kyle about. And it's important because there's so many different use cases that you could do with AI, and it's really hard to kind of sift through them all. These are just the uh, handful of the use cases we've already powered using our platform to date. And you can see some of them we talked about, the moderation, visual search. People use that to do recommendations, like West Elm. Uh, organizing is a big use case. Uh, a lot of more recent traction on the security and surveillance um, applications, either from drone uh, videos or security cameras, um, and even protecting your own brand so that you're not uh, allowing things to be posted when you don't want them to be. And just to give you a sense of the people we work with, it's really, really broad. And we try to like think about how they're using us and kind of what what use case they get they fall into. Um, but you can see it's across different verticals from real estate to gardening to travel, uh, restaurant industry, retail, uh, even the Department of Defense. Um, so it's really exciting to be able to offer the platform uh, in its kind of raw functionality and support so many different use cases. Um, so some of them that are uh, really exciting in the public sector are uh, a lot of aerial uh, applications. Uh, so think about satellites um, orbiting the planet or drones flying around, aircrafts taking pictures and, and video. We can understand a lot about what is on the ground from that information. And maybe it's a vehicle, maybe it's a weapon system, maybe it's a bunch of people walking around, uh, maybe it's buildings that you want to trace out. And there's lots of good use cases for this. For example, um, in, in this scenario, uh, it's after a forest fire, you want to identify where the people might be, that you can go and help rescue, or where vehicles might be, where debris could be blocking roads, anything like that after a natural uh, disaster, um, uh, like a fire or a hurricane, is uh, a really uh, uh, good natural aid. And then you know, the flip side of this is when a disaster like this happens, insurance companies also need to understand what is the damage and how do they assess that at scale. Because in this case, every house um, and yard has had complete damage. Uh, so they need to be able to do that. And it might not even be safe yet to fly people uh, or put people on the ground. Um, so we want to be able to provide that from the sky. Um, oops, sorry. And then in, in terms of tracking people, so this is now taking those detections you saw throughout the talk, but attaching a tracker to them. And this is something we've been working on more recently. Um, you can't really read the numbers, I don't think, um, but on top, uh, each colored box is actually a, a unique track identifier. So like the, the pink um, or purple uh, lady walking down the edge of the sidewalk, um, that is a unique identifier tracking her. And we might not know her name or anything because we didn't run face recognition. But if you did pair those two technologies together, you could actually maybe identify that specific person. But we're, in this case, we're tracking where that person's walking. And so if you wanted to do this inside a store, you might be able to see where people actually walk specifically across the aisles. Are they looking at the advertisements throughout the store? Um, and are they in groups? That kind of information. Uh, and of course, if they steal something, where do they go with it? So uh, tracking is a really powerful technology you're going to see a lot more of uh, coming out of Clarify. Now I'm, I'm just going to wrap up um, with a few uh, 
specific customer use cases. I touched on West Elm. Uh, what it actually looks like is in their style finder, which you can Google and go to uh, yourself. Uh, you can see um, you upload your Pinterest board. It rips out the images, and then it recommends West Elm furniture for you. Now, Staples, completely different use case. They're improving uh, search engine optimization using Clarify, and they're doing this across Europe. And the problem in Europe is that there's so many different languages in neighboring countries that doing the tagging manually to improve SEO becomes unfeasible at scale. And so they're predicting in about a dozen different languages using our general model to improve search results on uh, services like Google or Bing. In Travago's use case, they're doing a similar thing on their own website to recognize the hotel images and classify them as like pool or bedroom or lobby so that when you're trying to find your you know, next vacation, you can find best pool in, in New York and find that automatically. Um, and so just to kind of wrap up as... Uh, as we're here at the AWS event. They've been a, a great partner from very early on, uh, supporting us at the, the seed stage with uh, cloud API credits to get us up and running on Amazon. And we've been running our production API, api.clarify.com, um, since 2014 on AWS. Um, so it's been a great partnership, and we leverage a lot of the technologies, common ones like EC2 to get machines, uh, S3 for storage, RDS for your user accounts, um, uh, elastic cache for caching, making things fast. And so uh, it's been a great partnership, and, and we just wanted to say thank you for, uh, for having us here as well today. Yeah, so there's a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you. I have actually several questions. Uh, so what type of the image files do you support? Do you support PDF? Uh, it's a good, great question. So image types, they're all in our documentation, but they're typically the standard ones, JPEG, PNG, TIFF, BMP, uh, WebP. I don't think we support uh, PDFs, though. Gotcha. Uh, if you would compare the quality. Uh, so no, no, sorry. Other question that I would have, your, in your general uh, model, do you recognize colors? Not in the general model, uh, but we have a color-specific model. Gotcha. Yeah. And if you would compare the quality of your general model with image recognition, we are a huge user of image recognition. What would you tell percentage-wise how better it is? It's hard to quantify against other competitors because the vocabularies are significantly different. So for example, you saw love and togetherness, which don't exist um, that we've seen in other vocabularies from people like Google or Microsoft or Amazon. So it's hard to kind of give a, a quantitative answer. Gotcha. Uh, but that's why we have demos, so you can just literally upload and start trying on your data. Uh, if I can ask you about the pricing model, yep. uh, how, much, how do you charge for the API if I want to use your API? Yeah, so the API is all usage-based pricing. So the more images you pass through and the more models they go through, uh, the higher your bill is. And it's something like $1.20 for a, a thousand images with our pre-trained models. Thank you. Yep, thank you.